a Marvel juggernaut that flamed out after only one sequel, an edgy, stylized franchise that absolutely bombed on its second outing. Blade Runner? More like Blade Dunner. These 11 franchises could have been huge. Instead, they flopped after just one sequel. In 2002, Scooby-Doo proved to be a box office hit. And how could it not be? A live-action adaptation of one of the most popular cartoons in history, Scooby-Doo was a wacky romp that could appeal to youngsters and nostalgic adults alike. However, live-action adaptations of cartoons tend to be projects that only work financially once. The novelty has worn off for most audiences after a single installment. The Smurfs 2, Garfield, The Tale of Two Kitties, Peter Rabbit 2, the list of examples go on and on. Scooby-Doo also suffered from this phenomenon. As its sequel, Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed, was a box office disappointment. The film's $181 million worldwide gross was roughly 35% worse than the global box office haul of its predecessor. Monsters Unleashed may have delivered more familiar Scooby-Doo foes from their original cartoon, but this new installment suffered from mixed reviews along with a less hospitable March release date compared to the first film's June launchpad. With these financial shortcomings, another theatrical live-action Scooby-Doo, penned by James Gunn and meant to take place in Scotland, was given the axe. We're gonna die! Stay positive! We're gonna die quickly! Laura Croft as a video game character has been plundering ruins for decades, which has turned this fictional figure into one of the more enduring characters of 1990s video games. On the big screen, though, Laura Croft hasn't been so lucky, with the original live-action movie adaptation of Tomb Raider, starring Angelina Jolie, sputtering out after just two entries. It didn't initially seem like the franchise would be so short-lived. Laura Croft Tomb Raider made serious bank at the worldwide box office in the summer of 2001. Capitalizing on the popularity of Croft and Jolie's increasing star power, the film came along at the perfect time in every respect. Unfortunately, it wasn't particularly beloved by audiences or critics despite its sizable box office returns. When Laura Croft, The Cradle of Life dropped into cinemas in the summer of 2003, moviegoers gave the production the cold shoulder. With the film raking in significantly less cash than its predecessor, it was game over for the Laura Croft movie franchise. Thanks to this extremely disappointing box office development, this staple of video game history wouldn't find its way back to movie theaters until its reboot 15 years later. The original The Exorcist wasn't just a hit, it was a pop culture sensation. There was no going back for American horror after the release of William Friedkin's magnum opus, with every scary movie released in its wake existing in its shadow. This level of influence meant it was only a matter of time before the producers of the movie decided to try their hand at continuing the story. Despite the definitive ending of the original film, Exorcist II, The Heretic, hit theaters in 1977, four years after the original. While The Exorcist was greeted with universal praise, The Heretic became one of the worst-reviewed horror movies of all time. Original Exorcist director William Friedkin was among the chorus of moviegoers who despised the project, going so far as to declare that The Heretic was one of the worst films he'd ever watched. What inspired this deluge of vitriol? Mostly a confounding plot and moments that elicited giggles rather than screams. With this kind of response, the prospect of an ongoing Exorcist franchise suddenly seemed a lot less probable than before. The Exorcist only wound up being resurrected in 1990 when William Peter Blatty, author of the novel the original Exorcist was based on, decided to write and direct a third installment himself. The Exorcist 3 is much more well-regarded than The Heretic, probably because its creator actually had an understanding of the source material. Vin Diesel is best known for being fast and furious on the silver screen, but Dominic Toretto isn't his only character that loves a good burst of adrenaline. In 2002's Triple X, Diesel plays Xander Cage, a super spy who uses extreme sports to save the world. You've just entered the Xander Zone. Triple X was a solid box office performer and was enough of a moneymaker to ensure that it would get a couple of sequels. If James Bond could keep going and going, Xander Cage could surely sustain a few more installments. A sequel did emerge with the 2005 feature Triple X State of the Union, but the production had a massive issue with Diesel, or rather his absence. To the producer's dismay, Diesel chose not to return for the sequel and had to be replaced by Ice Cube. While the rapper-turned-actor is certainly no slouch, the original idea was to create an iconic character that people could follow for endless adventures, not somebody who would get swapped out after a single installment. 
Unsurprisingly, State of the Union crumbled at the box office and destroyed any hopes for a sprawling franchise. While the Fast and Furious movies have managed to deliver new adventures on a regular basis, it would take more than a decade for another triple X installment, The Return of Xander Cage, to hit theaters, with, you guessed it, Diesel returning as Xander Cage. The original Blade Runner wasn't exactly a box office smash, but it proved to be so enormously influential that a sequel was an inevitability. After years of development, Blade Runner 2049 hit theaters in October 2017, courtesy of director Denis Villeneuve. Before the sequel's release, Villeneuve and producer Ridley Scott openly discussed their hopes and story ideas for a potential Blade Runner 3. Sadly, those hopes were immediately threatened by the box office earnings. Despite lots of pre-release hype, 2049 underperformed on its opening weekend. What once looked like a surefire way to re-energize the Blade Runner universe suddenly wasn't looking so promising. This critical problem didn't get rectified in the weeks afterward either, as 2049 ended up losing money once its worldwide box office run was finished. With this development, the idea of doing further Blade Runner movies was shelved, with Villeneuve moving his sci-fi storytelling abilities into the world of Dune instead. Despite both entries in the franchise scoring critical acclaim, box office woes have so far kept further Blade Runner movies from gracing the silver screen. Box office expectations often miss severely when it comes to comedy sequels. While projects like City Slickers and Horrible Bosses made big bucks at the box office, their respective follow-ups just failed to click with moviegoers. Still, the allure of delivering the rare The Hangover Part 2 or 22 Jump Street at the box office means that studios still try their luck at launching hit comedy franchises. This includes a follow-up to the 2014 sleeper hit Neighbors, which ended up becoming one of Seth Rogen's biggest movies. The same could not be said for Neighbors 2 Sorority Rising, a follow-up that flipped the script by having Rogen and Rose Byrne team up with their former enemy, Zac Efron, to take down a sorority house. That's right. I'm switching sides. The result was a project that just didn't connect with moviegoers, partially because the premise didn't seem all that different from the original. Although technically profitable by making $108 million worldwide on a $35 million budget, Neighbors 2 was a massive step down from the original Neighbors film. Any potential for Neighbors taking a cue from The Hangover and going on for an entire trilogy was stopped cold with Sorority Rising, which turned out to be both a franchise killer and yet another example of an underperforming comedy sequel. At the start of the 2010s, director Roland Emmerich announced that there were finally plans to make a sequel to Independence Day. Not only that, but the filmmaker openly discussed his ambitions to make multiple follow-ups to his 1996 sci-fi disaster movie. Even though only a single sequel was eventually greenlit, Emmerich was eager to discuss his detailed ambitions for the future of the series. Ultimately, however, Emmerich would not get a chance to realize the entirety of his vision. The original Independence Day was one of the biggest box office hits of the 1990s, but its sequel was one of the biggest disappointments of 2016. The project's financial troubles could be chalked up to all sorts of factors, including intense competition from other blockbusters that summer along with relatively lousy marketing. Whatever the reasons for resurgence failing to meet box office expectations were, it was quickly made clear that there would not be a third Independence Day. Nobody involved with the original Speed imagined the movie sustaining a series of sequels, especially not director Jan de Bont. Alas, the film's massive box office intake meant that DeBont was contractually obligated to direct a second installment, but this time it would be without Keanu Reeves. The loss of their leading man should have been the first warning sign for the producers at 20th Century Fox, but that didn't stop them from pouring over $110 million into the budget. It certainly didn't help that the intense and claustrophobic setting of a bus from the original Speed was traded out for a massive boat, an idea that DeBont claimed came to him in a dream. Of course, Speed 2 Cruise Control ended up being more of a nightmare. June 1997 was an exceptionally crowded time for blockbusters, meaning the film had to compete with the likes of Batman and Robin, Con Air, and the Lost World Jurassic Park. It didn't stand a chance, and Cruise Control quickly became nothing more than a punchline. It's unknown if there were any initial plans to develop a Speed 3, but the failure of this doomed follow-up ensured that studio executives wouldn't try to kick the Speed franchise into high gear again. The enduring popularity of Lee Child's Jack Reacher books meant that it was only a matter of time before Reacher would get to star in a theatrical film. This opportunity finally emerged in December 2012 with Jack Reacher, which functioned as yet another star vehicle for Tom Cruise. 
The production wasn't as big of a hit as the novels, but Jack Reacher still proved reasonably profitable on its more restrained budget. Paramount Pictures, which wasn't exactly bursting with franchises in the mid-2010s, was willing to gamble on Jack Reacher. A sequel Jack Reacher Never Go Back wouldn't emerge until October 2016, a whopping four years after its predecessor debuted in theaters. The original Jack Reacher was well-liked, but was it beloved enough to maintain audience entrance for so long? No, not really. You're right. The numbers don't add up. Never Go Back ended up flopping, killing off Jack Reacher as a viable theatrical franchise in the process. When the character finally did reappear, it was in an Amazon TV series starring Alan Richson in the title role. Certain Marvel superheroes have no shortage of big screen hits. Iron Man and Captain America have both received plenty of solo outings and crossover appearances, while Spider-Man seems destined to be rebooted and reimagined over and over again. However, there are plenty of other figures from this comic book company's vast library of characters that have been less successful at maintaining longevity in theaters. Case in point, Ghost Rider, a darker, more edgy superhero that initially seemed to be poised for franchise success when he made his big screen debut in 2007. The first Ghost Rider film, which starred Nicolas Cage in the title role, was a solid box office performer. Ghost Rider yielded a sequel, Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance, but there were a few problems that ended up causing the franchise to crash and burn. Most glaringly, there was a five-year gap between the two Ghost Rider movies, a stretch of time during which the first two Iron Man films were released. At the end of the day, this new Ghost Rider simply didn't offer anything new to audiences. An R rating might have saved the series, but executives decided to play it safe instead. While there were originally plans for a third Ghost Rider, the dismal box office intake of Spirit of Vengeance slammed the brakes on those prospects. The character has yet to surface in the MCU, but a different version of the character made an appearance on Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. TV series. When Sin City first hit theaters in April 2005, it was considered new and fresh. Mainstream American cinema wasn't exactly yearning for more noir tributes, but Robert Rodriguez's heavily stylized world made the film stand out from the rest. With several other Sin City stories from the comics yet to be adapted, it seemed like only a matter of time before Sin City became an ongoing franchise. However, it took nearly a decade before Sin City, A Dane to Kill For, finally ended up in movie theaters. By the time A Dane to Kill For rolled around in August 2014, the cinematic landscape had changed dramatically. The visual look of Sin City had already been copied to death by other filmmakers, and audiences had simply moved on, resulting in a disastrous box office haul. Any plans for additional Sin City movies were immediately shelved, unlikely ever to see the light of day. What at once seemed like a foolproof franchise quickly turned into two movies with vastly differing receptions. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Lupa videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.